I want to thank our funders, <clears throat> particularly the Meyer Memorial Trust, uh, the Oregon Conservation and Recreation Fund, Collins Foundation, and many, many private donors and smaller foundations that have made all of our work possible. So thank you so much. It, it truly is uh, the case where you got to put fuel in the tank to get down the road. We appreciate that. Uh, today is going to be focusing on four aspects of the uh, feasibility study that um, I think are determinant about why and how we're going to uh, go forward on uh, sea otter restoration here in Oregon. And I'm going to share my screen and go through the agenda uh, with you just briefly. So if that works, there we are. <clears throat> um, Lynn Lee is going to kick it off uh, and talk about the ecosystem effects of renewed sea otter presence. And this is a huge topic. This is the, one of the important aspects of why we're doing what we're doing. Salvador Jorgensen is gonna be talking about great white sharks, the fact that this might be a wild card in how we think about sea otter restoration in Oregon. Uh, Sarah Hamilton's gonna bring us up to date on uh, kelp forest status and trends and Alan Shanks gonna be uh, talking about Dungeness crab the life history and considerations for sea otter restoration. Jumping right to Lynn, uh, Dr. Lynn Lee is uh, an ecologist with Parks Canada. She lives and works on, uh, in Haida Gwaii, uh, more particularly with the Gwaii Hanas National Park. And I'll let her talk about this wonderful project that she's been involved with, with the Haida Nation. And uh, so with that, uh, We'll uh, go to, to Lynn and uh, Chanel, you can toggle her in and Lynn can let her rip. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bob. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Hi, everyone. I'm Lynn Lee and I work for uh, Guayana's National Park Reserve, National Marine Conservation Area Reserve and Haida Heritage Site. So I'm gonna share with you some work of many colleagues and also work that we're doing directly at Guayanas related to sea otters. Uh, okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Can you see that as a full screen? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so I do I have half an hour or do I slightly more than half an hour just out of curiosity? 30 minutes. Half. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna tell you about is Chihu Til Inisdel, and that's Haida for nurturing seafood to grow. Um, and that's the name of the project that we're doing directly in Guayanas. But I'm also gonna tell you about the work of many other people in British Columbia, Southeast Alaska and California, including many like Tim Tinker um, and others that are here. So I'll just go ahead because I have a lot of pictures and a lot of things to go through um, and I'll try and make it on time. So we're going to have a swim over a forest, land and sea for those of you who are not lucky enough to scuba dive, how everything depends on everything else, um, the ecological effects of sea otters, oops, and uh, we're working together to restore balance, which is our project in Guayanas. So forest, land and sea, for those of you who walk in the coastal rainforest, this is what it looks like. And I'm sure you're all familiar with it. And if you were to go underwater, you would see similar things. So the forests of kelp underwater are similar with the same kind of structure where you have uh, the equivalent of trees for the canopy forming kelps. And then you also have the understory kelps and equivalent of mosses and shrubs and herbs. So many different layers and diversity within the kelp forest. Um, and on land, you have grazers like this deer and on Haida Gwaii, they're introduced. So we have hyperabundant deer that are grazing down all of the understory and the herb and shrub layers in the forest. Underwater, uh, sea urchins are native here, but they are hyperabundant for uh, the reasons of sea otter loss. And they're uh, very voracious grazers as well. And so they have this um, Aristotle's lantern, it's called, I love the name. Uh, and it's the jaw part that makes a star-shaped mark and eats kelp and other things that it grazes off the bottom. So where there are lots of urchins, this is a photo from Haida Gwaii here. Uh, it's very hard for kelp to grow. This one managed to survive, but you can see that we have an urchin barren, which is what we call this uh, rocky reef that has lots of urchins and mostly just coralline algae. We have three major species here um, in BC, and it's the red urchin that you just saw. This is a green urchin, and you can see them climbing up to the kelp stalk. 
Um, and then these are purple urchins that like to be in more exposed areas. Um, and when we still had sunflower sea stars, these are predator halos around the sea stars. Um, and so when you do have otters around, and this is a spot on the central coast where otters have been for over 30 to 40 years, um, and you can see that that understory structure of kelp has come back and that there are a few grazers in the ecosystem compared to the urchin barrens without otters. Uh, also, the olive grove. Uh, and so these guys are, I'm just turning my video off because uh, of my bandwidth. Um, and these guys also get grazed when urchins are around. And so when the grazing pressure is not so high, then they start to form as well. So you get this whole diversity of the ecosystem that is not possible when otters are around and foraging. Um, and so there's this web of very, um, complicated, everything depends on everything else, uh, interactions between all of these species and people in the ecosystem. And this all happens, these complex ecosystem interactions within uh, local contexts. So there, although there are generalities that are uh, common across the range of sea otters, there are also local scale complexities that change those interactions. Um, and so some of these strong interactions, as many of you will know, is that sea otters eating invertebrates keep their numbers down, especially the grazing ones, and then that allows kelp to grow. Um, and so this indirect effect from this trophic cascade is that when sea otters are foraging in rocky shore areas, you generally have more kelp. And then we also have this millennia long relationship between coastal First Nations, sea otters, shellfish, kelp, and the coastal ecosystem. So for millennia, uh, evident in midden sites, there are bones of sea otters and abalone and clams and mussels and many other shellfish that persist through millennia. Um, and so this was all disrupted during the maritime fur trade from the late 1700s to the mid 1800s. And so this loss of sea otters has created a um, situation where we have hyperabundant invertebrates. Um, and so these shellfish were released from sea otter predation, increased, and in particular, the grazing sea urchins uh, grazed a lot of kelp. And so our whole coastal ecosystems today are very much different, we think, than what they were in the past. Um, and remember that human hunting of sea otters for cultural purposes is also a big part of the past. Um, and so even in 1877 on Haida Gwaii, there is a quote from George Dawson when he was one of the early explorers. And he says, below high water mark, in some places, the large urchins are very thickly strewn over the bottom. So that shows you the effects of loss of sea otters from quite a long time ago. And so if you look at this over a timeline, um, this is obviously not to scale, that in, in uh, general terms, the ecosystem would have had more kelp and sea otters in the past before the maritime fur trade, and then much less abalone and urchins and other invertebrates. And then we had this very short dramatic decline in sea otters over about 50 years with the industrial fur trade and so that allowed their invertebrate prey to then increase in abundance over time as sea otters were declining. Um, and as the grazers increased, then the kelp would have decreased. And so now uh, in British Columbia, we also had a commercial fishery for abalone that in a short 20 years fished most of the abalone from the system. Um, and at the same time that that happened, we also have reintroduction of sea otters um, that you heard about yesterday and increasing numbers, uh, population growing throughout the coast uh, over the last few decades and, um, and therefore effects on invertebrates and kelp as they grow. So in general terms, this is what you see underwater in a rocky reef when otters are present and there are lots of them and they've been around for a while. You see a lot of greenery and that's a giant kelp forest on the west coast of Vancouver Island where they were first introduced. Um, in the middle are an area on Haida Gwaii where sea otters are not present. So you can see there's still kelp, but it's in the very shallow fringing parts of the ecosystem and then urchin barrens below. Uh, and then of course there's recovering areas where sea otters have started to eat some of the urchins and kelp is starting to come back. And of course, this is not uh, the same everywhere across the coast, even where sea otters are, there's a mosaic of ecological conditions that change over space and over time as sea otters move and as um, the local conditions change. So this I'm pretty excited to show you. So on Haida Gwaii, we have the natural return of sea otters or ku as they're known in Haida. And they uh, are starting to change parts of the uh, archipelago 
back to kelp forests where there were urchin barrens. So these are pictures I just recently took uh, last month on a field survey of a kelp forest that has had known sea otter foraging and just a few sea otters for about five years. And so what we see is that there are places where this kelp forest of bull kelp is coming back quite strong um, and the understory is starting to develop. We saw actually the most sunflower stars I've seen since uh, sea star wasting disease. So we saw four on this one dive in this location, but unfortunately also saw one that was melting. Um, and so you can see there's not just uh, the kelps, but also different red algaes and other algaes that are smaller starting to grow. And you can also see the bryozoan animal community starting to grow um, along with some urchins still in the system. Um, and so you can also see this patchwork of dynamics happens at a very local scale. So within tens to hundreds of meters, there can be urchin barrens, as you see to the right in the foreground, and then kelp starting to form where urchins have been eaten. So the change that sea otters create depends on the number that are there and how long they've been there and the local conditions. And in this case, because we have few animals, they've been there for a long time, but there are lots of urchins to eat. And so it's taking a while to eat urchins and the transformation is happening in these mosaic of patches throughout the site. Um, and from the surface, what we see is that what used to be a very fringing kelp forest of bull kelp is now extensive down to about 40 feet, where before it would have been closer to the zero tide mark, um, maybe 10 feet down. Um, and so I'm going to go through some ecological effects and generalities that people have found in studies throughout the coast of BC in Southeast Alaska and California. And again, these are generalities and some uh, context specific differences. So keep uh, in mind that we, we have these generalities about what sea otters do to the ecosystem, but local scale context uh, matters a lot. And also the sea otter densities, abundance, and the sex differences. Um, so this is work uh, from my PhD, which looked at the interaction between abalone and sea otters. Um, again, involving a lot of people, um, and those are just a few. So here's a picture of sea otter from Haida Gwaii eating an abalone. And so the results of that work showed that exposed abalone were 16 times lower in density in areas where sea otters were compared to where they weren't. Um, but that cryptic abalone, so the ones that are hiding in crevices and harder to find, were two times higher. So overall densities were lower, but two times higher. And so we see a change in behavior of animals that sea otters eat, not just a change in the number, um, and this depiction shows that um, in, without sea otters, you have this really shallow fringing kelp forest and all the food is right near the surface. So all of the abalone and urchins are packed close to the shallows. And if you imagine there's no three dimensional structure, so currents are sweeping through pretty quickly. And as the sea otters eat the urchins and kelp is allowed to grow, then you get more three dimensional structure and more entrainment of food and larva um, and in fact, you see abalone going deeper in the ecosystem than they were before, and then becoming more cryptic. And of course, um, a lot of work that Jane Watson has done with a 20 or 30 year time series of kelp forest um, change with sea otters has found the succession that happens on land in the forest is similar to succession that can happen in the ocean with different species of kelp as well. And so for abalone, they're out in the open. Um, when otters aren't around. And then when they are, you have to dig through all of this kelp to find the abalone that are there, but the abalone and uh, urchins and other grazers are hiding primarily uh, in the ecosystem. And so the work I did was with Dr. Ann Solomon in her lab and Jen Burt is another PhD student. And she also worked on sea otter interactions, mostly with sea urchins. And she also had sea star wasting disease um, hit in 2015. So you can see from this graph, uh, when you have no sea otters, you have very high densities in, of urchin biomass. And then when otters occupy a site, it goes from very high to quite low, can be quite quickly in this case in one year. And the continuously occupied areas have very but low densities of urchins. So at no point do urchins disappear, um, they coexist, but at much different levels. Um, and so here's a picture of what things look like at that site in 2013 and 14 uh, after sea otters moved in. Um, in other ecosystems, so this is work from California, 
that Tim was involved in. The trophic cascade can happen also in kelp for or in eelgrass uh, meadows. And so in this case, the top predator is still the otter. And when they moved into Elkhorn Slough, they ate a lot of the crabs, which were intermediate predators. The crabs then, um, or the mesograzers that the crabs ate were released from predation and that allowed the primary producers to increase. And in fact, in Elkhorn Slough, they increased 600 times in biomass. And so that had a very dramatic effect um, in California. On the other hand, even though this relationship is still exists, there was no coast of BC looking at what happened in California and British Columbia did not find the dramatic um, effects and in fact there was no evidence of increase so it was stable but not necessarily increasing with the presence of sea otters and some of that is the context dependency that I was talking about and one of the big differences is the difference in coastline where in California in Elkhorn Slough um, because it's so exposed in the outer coast, those sea otters were primarily feeding only in the eelgrass meadows. Where it is, as in British Columbia, you can see from this picture that the eelgrass meadow is surrounded by rocky reef. And so there are lots of different other habitat types that the sea otter can eat from and forage in. So the actual effect on the individual eelgrass meadows are not as dramatic as seen in California. Um, and one, a couple of other things about effects on seagrass meadows that we're just coming to know. So from some work up in Alaska, they're finding decreased depth of eelgrass from sea otter digging for clams in Southeast Alaska and how pervasive that is, I'm not sure. Um, and then stay tuned for next Friday, uh, there will be a release of a publication in Science for uh, more dramatic eelgrass effects on eelgrass communities. Okay, so Apex is the Apex Predators Ecosystems and Community Stability work done by Jenny Eckhart and her team up in Southeast Alaska, looking a lot at soft sediment habitats. Um, and so this is from Glacier Bay. Uh, not surprisingly, I'm just going to click through so you can see. Um, when sea otters are present, that's in the brown, there are generally more clams than uh, after sea otters move in. And at the bottom, uh, we go from having no sea otters to having lots of sea otters. And the thing to notice is that sea otters don't like to be in areas that don't have a lot of clams. And so you see this dramatic reduction in the biomass of clams when there are lots of clams to begin with on that beach. But in the beaches where there are low densities of clams or low biomass of clams, it's not really worth their while to eat there. And so you can see that they don't have as much of an effect when they move in. And in some cases, um, those are not where they would prefer to be. So there are fewer sea otters there. Um, and the, the connection with people, of course, is that now that we have these commercial shellfish fisheries, we're competing with sea otters for food. And so when, uh, when you look at the diet and what sea otters are eating, 46% of their diet comes from commercially important species. Um, and so here are the clams that we were talking about, the intertidal clams, and then there's also crabs and other urchins that get eaten as food sources that are um, uh, contributing to their diet, a lot to their diet. And then there's lots of other um, invertebrates that contribute as well, but to a smaller degree. And so it's this effect on the commercially important uh, species that makes them um, so complicated to deal with. And, uh, and so here is another way of showing that the con contribution of commercial species to the diet was almost 99% red sea urchins when otters first moved in um, and their densities were low. And then as their densities increase and they stay over time, then uh, they eat those larger commercial species and then they move on to the smaller, more diverse um, invertebrates. And so this is the dramatic effect that you see on commercial fisheries in most cases. Um, an increase in kelp, and then in theory, this increase in fish that should over time, uh, as fish increase, be beneficial for fin fish fisheries. Um, on the coast of British Columbia, the BC Coastal Ecosystem Services project uh, in Kai Chan's lab looked also at sea otters and varying levels of sea otter occupation time across the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, and so the generalities that they found, of course, were a decrease in the amount of large shellfish, um, an increase in the amount of kelp. And so you see there's a kind of a bump in the middle, kind of like you see on a second growth forest. So uh, when in the middle, when, uh, when that first pulse of kelp is coming in, there's a lot of it and then it self thins um, and becomes stable at a higher level than before the otters, with the, without the otters. 
And of course, these um, other things in the system, the kelp forest fishes, the small crabs, small snails, and kelp increase in abundance over time. And so some of these guys, you guys are familiar with, uh, some of the kelp forest fishes include commercially and uh, culturally important fish, copper rockfish, black rockfish, kelp greenling, lingcod, um, and of course, juvenile and adult herring, rockfish, and salmon use kelp forests as well. And so another way to look at this change in cross-section is with and without sea otters, so lots of urchins, and fringing kelp versus uh, kelp getting deeper when otters are around. Um, and so this work also showed what other work has oops, shown is that urchins are rare when otters are around. The kelp is four times deeper, and then the area of kelp covered is about 19 times larger when sea otters are around. And this is in coastal British Columbia. Um, so back to Glacier Bay, some satellite kelp mapping has shown um, how otter populations moving in over time have uh, correlated with a, total number of pixels that have kelp, so showing the increase in the area of coverage in terms of uh, kelp canopy in correlation to sea otter population growth in the area. And fish abundance, so this is also work from the west coast of Vancouver Island, um, looking at areas with and without sea otters, they uh, scale up to about 46 times more rockfish. So there's an increase in the density, but because of the increase in the area of kelp forests, you get even more potential habitat and area for rockfish to thrive. Um, the take home message from this work also from the same group, Kai Chan's lab, um, is that increases in fish catch happen when sea otters are around regardless of whether there's human fishing pressure. So in general, um, it, the presence of sea otters and the benefits from increased kelp seem to be um, increasing fish regardless of whether there's some human fishing as well. Um, we also see these change in what the rockfish are eating. So they, uh, this is a graph I won't explain too much other than to say if these uh, polygons, the shapes overlap, then they're eating the same kinds of things. And if they don't overlap, then um, they're eating different things. And the, on the uh, vertical axis, when you go eating higher up in the food chain. And so when sea otters are around, the, the things that rockfish are eating are higher up in the food chain than without the sea otters in the system. We lost your audio, Lynn. Uh -oh. We lost her completely. Oh, she's back. Hello. Oh, you're there. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My internet connection died. Um, so, yeah, of course, there's herring spawning habitat. Uh, and this is also really good for people who like to eat herring, um, row on kelp. And this is called a cow, gao in Haida. Um, and of course, it's a tradi traditional food that's harvested every spring. Um, and so kelp also provides some resilience to climate change, increasing physical shoreline protection, carbon um, potential carbon uh, cycling and increasing local dissolved oxygen and decreasing local ocean acidification. Oh, I'm having troubles with my computer, sorry. Uh, and so finally, the last section is about our project in Guayanas. So working together to restore balance. So you can see there are lots of partners involved, including all of our management partners and fishing industry and a, um, a bunch of universities. And so we're transforming urchin barrens into kelp forests for all of the good reasons that we were talking about for ecological and cultural species. Um, and here we are in Northern British Columbia. And uh, the federal government with Parks Canada and Fisheries and also there's a management board that's
Sorry, guys. My internet is very bad today. Okay, try again. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Actually, actually, it's a miracle you can you can <laughs> communicate from Haida Gwaii to us at all. <laughs> okay. Um, so all these um, these six ethics and values are the guiding principles in the Land Sea People Management Plan for Guayanas, which was signed off in 2018 by all the management partners. And so because of that, ecological and cultural and uh, social concerns are as important for restoration projects. And so as part of this work, we had community food and urchin cracking by commercial fishermen and Haida, Haida fisheries divers uh, sorry, computer troubles. And here's a picture of really nice looking red urchin row, which is what we want for food. And it's called Gudingai in Haida. And so as part of the project, not we did the restoration work, but where we had good quality urchins, we also brought Gudingai into the communities for traditional food and sharing in the schools. Um, and had school programming to teach people about the kelp forest ecosystem and about traditional foods and how to process and eat them. So short video to show you the change that happened. So this is a, the, the restoration site before the work. Uh, and then this is the site after the work. So you can still see there's a lot of coralline algae, but that really fast return and growth of the annual species like bull kelp and desmorestia um, had taken over the site just <laughs> over the short term. I'll tell you that story too. Um, and so this is what it looked like from the air. So pre-restoration, you can see there's only a few sticks of kelp. And then post-restoration, you can see there was a lot of kelp. But that was just in the July following. And so uh, unfortunately, we did not see that in uh, July 2020 or 21. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So when we map the kelp forest change before and after, you can definitely see post-restoration in 2019 that there was a lot more kelp at the restoration site. Um, and a lot less change at the control. And so that's what we're doing with the research is trying to the invisible change that's happening in these kelp forest ecosystems. So at the edge of the kelp, um, there's lots of urchins with lots of row, and then deeper in the barrens, they don't have as much row at all. And so more food equals more gonads for these urchins. Um, and at the edge of the kelp, in, you also have higher growth rates. So we were able to tag these abalone and recover them. Um, and you can see in the blue where the edge of the kelp, those urchins are getting more food. And then they, they're growing faster than the urchins that are not getting as much food in the barrens. Um, and the other thing to note is that the smaller urchins, less than about 50 millimeters, are growing at about the same rate, whether they're in the barrens or at the edge of the kelp. So we think those little guys are eating other things things and they don't require kelp to grow as fast and as soon as they get bigger and they need kelp then if they have it they grow faster and if they don't they still grow but they grow slower so bigger urchins grow faster with more kelp um, because of those little respiration chambers the researchers were able to look at uh, what happened at the edge of the kelp where urchins are getting food and so their breathing rate was much higher than deeper in the barrens. And so that's an indication of their metabolic activity. And so these little guys have been dubbed zombies because they exist and they don't need a lot of food, but they go into this metabolically depressed state where they don't need a lot to survive. And so at the edge of the kelp, what you're seeing is that urchin row does not change very much if they have enough food, but that deeper in the barrens, and we did the restoration work, then we had more row in the gonads of those urchins deeper in the barrens because they had more kelp after we did the work. Um, and some lab work done by uh, our research, re research associates um, looked at the how you <laughs> transform an urchin, uh, a zombie. And so it doesn't matter where you get your urchins from, if they start, if they're starved um, and you feed them, they start to grow gonads. And, it, and then if you don't feed them, they still survive but they don't start to grow gonads. And it's, it's something that just takes weeks. And the commercial fishermen know this, they call it co um, conveyor belt fishing where they fish the feed line and then they wait a few months and then they can come back to the site and fish the feed line again because the urchins that are deeper will have moved up and gotten enough food and grown more row. And so in our case, this is what we saw, this less than 10 stipes of kelp at our restoration site to over 250 in the transects of our plots. But then in July, 2020 and 21, that kelp declined. And so for you know, 
practice at the same of sea otters because sea otters are always there foraging. Um, and so the interesting things about this were uh, that we had less kelp, but we're still seeing indications that we may have more row, even though structurally we still have less kelp. So both in 2020 and 2021, when we did the work, it looks anecdotal. Take four, sorry. Okay, okay. try again. <clears throat> I'm almost done. <laughs> yeah, we're we're we ready to wrap it up. <clears throat> okay, yeah, I'm almost done. Um, and so we're so we're also tracing the isotopes, which um, fatty acids, which will show us what sorts of things these animals are eating. So we think that even though there's less kelp, there are less urchins, and so they're still getting enough food. And so here are the contemporary conditions that we're looking at now are the result of sea otter loss. We have much less and smaller urchins um, and other large shellfish declining to no commercial shellfish fisheries in some areas where sea otters are, um, increased depth and um, area of eelgrass and kelp, and then increased numbers and genetic diversity of rockfish and other kelp forest fishes. And, um, and at some point, these guys start to increase. So even macroinvertebrates from their low levels are still persisting, but probably not to levels without sea otters. And there's potential for continuing subsistence and fisheries, recreational fisheries and tourism, but we are not sure to what extent commercial shell fisheries can be maintained when otters are around. So these are all big questions and things that I'm sure you're thinking about as you're thinking about otters in Oregon. And so just two slides. Um, sea otters return to Haida Gwaii, and this is a modeling and um, community engagement project to look at how sea otters are going to affect this whole social ecological system on Haida Gwaii. We know there won't be a one size fits all model because there are so many complexities, but the idea um, is that we're working, and Tim is one of our main um, collaborators on uh, ecosystem model to help us make um, decisions around what we should be doing in terms of management in future. Um, and it's a big collaboration with opportunities for innovation. We have the Haida Nation as partners, other coastal First Nations that are living with sea otters, federal and provincial government agencies, fishing industry, academia, ENGOs, and we're all trying to work together to address these issues of sea otters and climate change. So thanks and sorry for all the technical difficulties, Hawa. <laughs> <laughs>